A round of applause, everybody. Wapi my coffee. Give me more, give me more, give me more. Thank you. It's good to be back. Thank you so much, all of you, for this extraordinary welcome. Uh, and I am grateful for your hospitality. I am grateful for your friendship. It is a joy to be back with so many people who are family to me and so many people who claim to be family to me. <laughs> Everybody's a cousin. <laughs> you know, uh, I'm going to just stray from my prepared remarks for a moment uh, to describe for you the first time I came here. I was 27 years old. I had worked as a community organizer for four years. I had gotten to know Alma and fell in love with her, but we hadn't grown up together. And I was determined to better understand the life of my father and the life of his people. So uh, I flew to Nairobi, and Alma had a nice little flat, and we talked all day and all night, and I would wander through the city, and then finally it was time to come to Home Square. That's what we used to call it. And so we took a train, and the train went overnight. And the train went very slowly. <laughs> this was not a bullet train. And when we finally got to Kisumu, we took a bus. And this was not a fast bus. <laughs> and there were some chickens in my lap. And some sweet potatoes digging into my side. And then, we got somewhere around here, and we had to get on a matatu. And it was more crowded than the bus. <laughs> and then it dropped us off, and we walked up a dirt path. And then we walked some more, and we walked some more, and finally we came to Mama Sarah's house, although it wasn't quite as fancy as it is now. <laughs> and I was hungry, but I had to catch a chicken to eat. <laughs> so we scurried around the yard until we finally caught a chicken. And fortunately, uh, Mama Sarah was, was better with a knife than I was, because I think I got a little squeamish. And we ate. And then uh, before bed, there was a cistern where we had to bathe with a little ladle, and we were scooched underneath the water. And, uh, and I looked up at the stars, and I visited my father's grave. And it gave me uh, a sense of satisfaction that no five-star hotel could ever provide, because it Because it connected you uh, to your past, and it connected you to the stories of those who came before you, and it grounded you, and gave you a sense uh, of place that then fortified you for the future. And when I think about what Alma has now accomplished in building this center, uh, what I think about is that first night 
in the yard and that first night going to sleep without running water or indoor plumbing. Um, and the fact that uh, because she knew where she came from, because she understood her story and how it connected to the past and how it connected to the other young people in this community who maybe hadn't had as much opportunity as we had or had been quite as lucky. Um, it was out of that spirit that uh, the wonderful facility that we see today uh, has been built. So I, I tell you that story because I could not be prouder of what my sister has accomplished. And uh, it, uh, I think it makes all of us who are Obamas or claim to be Obamas extraordinarily proud. <laughs> now, three years ago, I visited Kenya as uh, the first sitting American president to come from Kenya. Um, <laughs> and when I was president, it was a little bit harder to get up here because my plane didn't fit uh, the tarmac up here. Um, and while three years ago my sister Alma introduced me before I gave uh, a speech, today I'm really coming as a brother, uh, as a citizen of the world, as someone with a connection to Africa to talk about the importance of what she's doing, uh, but also to create a larger context for what's possible. You know, as I was preparing for my remarks today, um, I thought about in that first visit in Alma's apartment in Nairobi, she had a poster. I don't know if you remember this. It was a, of a beautiful African woman. She looked a little bit like Alma, and her face was tilted upward, and over the poster it said, I have a dream. Do you remember that? So I asked Alma at that time, what was her dream? And she laughed and she said, oh, Barak, my biggest problem, Barak, I, I, I have too many dreams. <laughs> but today her dreams have come true and today we open Sautiku's Foundation Sports Resource and Vocational Training Center. I had a chance to look around, and it is a remarkable space. It's a community space, a library, a computer lab, a vocational center, a football pitch, and I'm very happy to see there's also a basketball court. So thank you, Maasai. Thank you, Giants of Africa. Um, I want to thank, obviously, all the people who made this possible the incredible generosity uh, that has been shown. But as I looked around, I saw something that was less concrete. It wasn't bricks and mortar. I saw possibility. The hope that we can become something bigger than we are. The thought about all the young people in the years to come who will learn here and grow here and dream bigger than they do. Now, Kenya has made extraordinary strides in recent decades. The barriers to progress that a young Kenyan faces today aren't as rigid as the ones that might have faced previous generations. A young Kenyan doesn't have to do what my grandfather did and serve a foreign master. A young Kenyan doesn't have to do what my father did and leave home in order to get an education. So there's been real progress in this amazing country. And it should inspire today's young Kenyans to demand even more progress. The good news is Kenya has a new constitution. It has a new spirit of investment and entrepreneurship. Despite some of the tumultuous times that seem to attend every election, we now have a president and a major opposition leader who have pledged to build bridges and have made specific commitments to work together. 
So what we see here in Kenya is all part of an emergent, more confident, and more self-reliant Africa. But we know that real progress depends on addressing the challenges that remain. It means rooting out the corruption that weakens civic life. It means no longer seeing different ethnicities as enemies or rivals, but rather as allies and seeing the diversity of tribes not as a weakness, but as a strength. It means making sure that economic growth reaches everyone and not just a few at the top, that it's broadly shared across regions. It means guaranteeing educational opportunity to everybody, not just our boys, but also our girls, because the nation that gives our daughters the same opportunities as our sons is more likely to succeed. So moving forward in all these areas is going to help extend opportunity and dignity to all of Kenya's people. And that's the goal of Sauti Ku. It begins with our young people in places like this. All of us providing the educational and economic and cultural opportunities that can empower some of the remarkable young people that you saw here today with the skills and the self-reliance to first change their own lives and then change their communities. Right now, Saudi Ku reaches as many as 800 young people a week. With the opening of this center, three years in the making, as a consequence of the extraordinary contributions of some of the people that Alma mentioned, like Gina, the Red Cross, our outstanding German golfers, the Eagles, and so many others, Saudi Ku is now going to be able to reach so many more people. And here, we're going to be able to strengthen the education and job training and career guidance that young people receive so that they can not only find gainful employment that allows them to build their own livelihoods, but also allows them to potentially be job creators and dream makers and give opportunities to others that follow. Now, here, we're going to help achieve sustainable economic growth by teaching rural Kenyans how to better harness the potential of local resources, determine their own futures. Here we can create a safe place for young people to come together with a focus on leadership and teamwork and empathy and health and wellness and to gauge in the positive behaviors that sports and music and drama and dance can develop so that they can discover their strengths and realize their potential. This center is going to be a place where children and young people, especially those who seek opportunity, learn the strength of their own voices. That's what Sauti Ku means, powerful voices. And while it is true that not every child who goes through the program here may end up having the opportunity to study in Germany, as Alma did, while it's true that not everybody may end up deciding that a career path in public life is what's right for them, if they just are given a small chance to express all that they feel and all the energy and imagination and talent that they represent, if they are given a platform, as this center can give them, the young people of this area, the young people throughout Kenya, the young people throughout Africa, will, will learn that their voices can change the world. We've seen it happen before. It's going to be their voices that will help determine whether or not our leaders are held accountable. It's going to be their voices who are going to determine whether or not Kenya comes together, regardless of tribe and ethnicity, to build a better future. It's going to be the, the voices of these young people echoing from these small villages and from big cities to determine the future of the world. 
I believe in them. They're not different than I am, or I was on that first trip up to Home Squared and that first night when I had a sense of who I was and maybe what I might be. And because of all the extraordinary work that so many of you have done, uh, I suspect that in our midst right now are going to be young people who do remarkable, world-changing things for many years to come. So thank you all so much for all the great work that you've done. Mungu, Abariki, Kenya, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. A round of applause. Wapi makofi, wapi makofi.